The San Francisco 49ers add not one, but two wide receivers in the 2024 NFL draft. What is their role? What are their strengths and weaknesses? And what's the plan short and long-term for the San Francisco 49ers at wide receiver? Next. You are Locked On 49ers, your daily San Francisco 49ers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On 49ers, Brian Peacock and Eric Crocker at BD Peacock at Crocky 209. Thanks, everybody, for making us your first listen on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team Every day, we appreciate the everydayers out there and hit that subscribe button. We appreciate that as well on YouTube or anywhere you get your podcasts. Today's episode of Locked On 49ers brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side and it is a fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. All right, Croc. The Niners shocked the world. Ricky Pearsall, first round pick. Jacob Cowing, that came back in the fourth round, number 135 overall to select the diminutive but very fast Arizona wide receiver. Let's start with Ricky Pearsall. And before we get a little bit into the scouting report and the strengths, the weaknesses here uh, of these wide receivers, do you what do you think the plan was on draft night on Thursday, Croc? Because there was all the talk about trading Debo, trading Ayuk. And to be honest with you, for this year, I love having the rookie wide receiver not have to be forced to be anything that Debo or Brandon Ayuk gave you. Keeping both of those veteran players, being the best you can, be the most explosive and dynamic you can on offense to go win yourself a, a, yourself a stinking championship, right? And then bring Ricky Pierce all along in year two to potentially be a starter in place of, say, Debo Samuel and play that Z role. I mean, that that's the most obvious fit for me, but it felt like there was a plan that could have been very different from that. It could have ended up being a different wide receiver. It could have maybe been a different position altogether that the 49ers drafted, and maybe it could have been uh, a trade of Debo or Ayuk to get them a player in the draft. And hell, the 49ers might even have traded down if they could have or up if they could have from 31, and they weren't able to do that either. So do you think that Pearsall was plan A all along, like they thought they were going to draft Pearsall going into the day, or do you think it was plan B, plan C, that they ended up with Ricky Pearsall at 31? Uh, when you watch his film and, and you see the things that he does well, it comes off as he was a very specific kind of receiver that the 49ers identified to fit in their offense and – that they like that. So I, I don't think that, and when you look at the other receivers that were taken, they're, they were different. They had really good skill sets, of course, but I'm not sure how much the 49ers prioritized those guys' skill sets over what he brings to their offense. So from that standpoint, I, you know, as a receiver, just purely talking about receivers, I'm not sure how many receivers they had over him that they would have potentially been able to draft. Now, heading into the draft, I think they probably had, couple of thoughts and ideas in their head that they wanted to do. One was, all right, if we were to move up, who will we move up for? And they probably identified those guys. Now, I think a lot of fans and even talking heads make it seem a lot easier to move up than what it is. And we've referenced the 2017 draft when they loved the thought of getting Ruben Foster. And they started calling teams in the teens to move up. And nobody would trade with him. They were going to draft him. One, they liked him top five. They didn't take him there because, you know, whatever. Okay, Solomon Thomas, we're going to start with him. But then, okay, once Ruben Foster got outside the top 10, which this was a guy who was kind of projected to go top 10. But once he started sliding, they're like, okay, we got to go get our guy. And they're trying to trade up for him, try to trade up for him, try to trade up for him. And they just couldn't until like late in the first round. So I think it, a lot of people think it's a lot easier to trade up than it is. Maybe you could just make up a, a package that nobody could just refuse. But I think with where the 49ers were picking, it would have been hard for them to go up and potentially get a tackle, which I think if they were to trade up for a position, it was going to be offensive tackle. And there was a run on those guys really from the start. And it ended around pick 20. No, because the Cowboys drafted Guyton uh, around whenever they were picking. So 29. I, I, 29? 
Yeah, because they moved down with the Lions. Right. So yeah. I, I just think it was a tough situation for them. And they settled on a guy that they prioritized wasn't fit. And I'm curious to see exactly how they look to deploy him in this offense with Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk still on the roster. <laughs> I come back to Thursday night and look, we were exhausted. Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch looked pretty exhausted. Like, I think there was a lot going on for them that day and that night. And uh, I think there's a number of ways this could have gone. But I do get the feeling that the wide receiver trade was to get them what they knew that they weren't going to be able to get at 31, and that was an offensive tackle. So I think that was the plan, which means that you had an extra first-round pick. So 31, I think they probably all along were kind of earmarking that for wide receiver. And when they didn't get the tackle, they realized, well, okay, that part of the plan is not going to happen, but we still like the wide receivers here. And then the question I have is, did the Chiefs go get Xavier Worthy from them? Would Xavier Worthy have been the pick there uh, at 31 if he was on the board? Or would Guyton have been the pick, right, if he did just get a few spots further down? But it also tells me that they didn't love Worthy or Guyton so much that they traded up because those trade-ups were available because other teams traded up. Right, if the team behind you goes up and gets a, a guy four picks ahead of you, uh, that means that pick was for trade four picks ahead of you, and you could have done the trade too, and maybe could have done it easier because you were one step closer to where that team was. So, um, whatever the plans were that could have possibly happened, one thing is clear: I think they had an idea that late round one it was going to be wide receiver for them. Maybe they would move down if they could. Didn't get the offers, and their best guy was Ricky Pearsall in the end. That's when it comes off with, from that standpoint. And even with uh, Xavier Worthy, you saw a lot. And here's the thing. A lot of people are like, oh, why are all these people mocking receiver to the 49ers? There's that part. Like yeah. now people were mocking Xavier Worthy to the 49ers. But prior to the draft, I'd say the day or two before, I saw a lot of that. I saw a lot of Xavier Worthy to the 49ers. A lot of receiver. I think uh, our guy, Peter Schrager, who did he have mocked to the 49ers? Uh, he had... He had Xavier Worthy going all the way up to like 17 in his final mock. Okay. But he did have a wide receiver to the 49ers. I don't remember who it was, though. Right. Might have been so, Mitchell or something. Yeah. So maybe there was a lot of chatter around the 49ers. People McConkey. Thinking, it might have been McConkey, actually, now that I think about it. Somebody had McConkey, I think, to the to the Niners okay. on that last day. But either way, they were spot on with maybe what the 49ers were thinking at 31. And right. You and I had asked, and I was like, man, why do people hate the pick? And you're like, well, I don't even think it has as much to do with uh, Ricky Pearsall as it does with it just not being offensive line. Right. And you and I tried to prepare people the whole time that, hey, you, you're not just going to draft offensive line just to draft an offensive lineman. And maybe they could have gotten uh, Powers jo uh, Jackson, and you and I was like, hey, this is a guy we like. But maybe Kyle, and, and, and listen, guys, we're not – this is not us making excuses for why they do what they do. It's just trying to get into the minds of why they do what they do. So, and you bring up, I don't want to, I don't want to draft a center first round. That's not going to play for me because I'm, I'm, I'm not going to start a, a center year one and, and maybe he will, but maybe that's what his th logic was. Or it's like, well, we can get a really good interior offensive lineman in the third round, which they ended up doing. So that's not a thing we're going to draft right now. And they knew that there was going to be a wide receiver run and they couldn't wait until round two because and there was four straight wide receivers at that point. It went Pearsall, Xavier Leggett to end round one. Then it went Keon Coleman and Lad McConkey, the first two picks. So four receivers in a row at the end of round one, beginning of round two. So even if they traded down three or four spots, you know, who knows? Maybe one of those teams like Pearsall more and they would have been choosing from a different group of, of wide receivers at that point too. Um, and it's interesting. You rip the, 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 the fake out, the Cooper DeGene fake out, the leak thing, right? So trying to figure out who the leak is, did that have to do with the wide receiver thing? Because a week before the draft, suddenly every analyst in the world's given the 49ers a wide receiver when nobody was mocking them wide receivers the whole time. Yeah. So I think there's something to it. They, somebody had good information. And sometimes, you know, the sometimes they get smoke screened. That wide receiver at 31 clearly wasn't a smoke screen. The 49ers were looking there. And I think that's what they had that pick earmarked for because they knew the tackle wasn't going to get there. The way to get the tackle was to trade Debo or Ayuk to get an earlier first round pick. I think there were also a lot of people that were upset with 
them not getting Cooper DeGene. But you and I, the way we viewed Cooper, or definitely me, it was if the 49ers are selecting him to play cornerback at pick 31, I would say absolutely not. Like, don't do that. If the 49ers are saying, hey, you're going to play safety for slash nickel, then I would say, okay, I'm on board with that. So I don't, I don't know how they viewed them, but the NFL let him kind of slide a little bit. So I think the NFL is more on the side of mm, not sure he's a corner at, at the next level. And then the Eagles, who drafted Mitchell, I'm assuming they drafted Mitchell and then drafted uh, him and said, oh, I think they're going to play him at safety potentially. Still got Darius Slay as well. Yeah, I think it's clear that the league viewed Cooper DeGene the same way we did, and that's why he wasn't the top 25 pick, and he went in the you know, early portion of the second round instead. Next, Rock, let's get a little deeper into the scouting reports of these wide receivers. Who is Ricky Pearsall? How is he going to get used? Who is Jacob Cowing? How is he going to get used? What's the long-term plan at wide receiver for the San Francisco 49ers? This episode of Locked Up 49ers brought to you by Monopoly Go. And we got to pause here to talk a little bit more about Monopoly Go. And I know what you're saying. Flag on the play. You already talked about that. But there's just so much good stuff in the game. You can team up with your friends. Yeah, I mean, first of all, you can destroy your friends and steal money out of their vaults. How much fun is that in Monopoly Go? But you can also work together with your friends if you're, if you're that kind of person. Timed tournaments where you work together to build up each other's boards. The more you win together, the more awesome prizes you will unlock, and there's so much to get. Unique stickers that you can trade with friends and compete albums for big prizes, cool new playing pieces to travel the boards with, hilarious emojis taunting your friends when you do decide to smash their buildings and heist their vaults. Plus, Monopoly Go feels new and exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go, so get off the bench and go download it now for free on Google Play or the App Store. It's game on. Monopoly Go. Pick 31 overall, it was Ricky Pearsall, the wide receiver out of Florida, Croc. And uh, we'll go through the uh, the measurables as well to remind the folks what the 49ers are getting in Ricky Pearsall. 6'1", 190, depending on the day he measures up, 189 at the combine, two pounds heavier, 191 at his pro day. He's got um, 441 speed, Croc, with a 14. I've seen conflicting reports on the 10-yard Split by the way, Croc, because 149 is blazing, and then another one was 157, which for a 44140, I think would be faster than that. So, uh, anyway, I get the feeling, Croc, when you look at his short shuttle and his three cone, his agilities 405 in the short shuttle, uh, an absolutely scorching three cone of 664 seconds, which is blazing fast, 42 inch vertical, as well as a nine foot or a 10 foot nine broad jump. So explosive, especially in the short area. That's why I kind of lean to the one four nine might actually be in the right ten yard split because I think in the four four one, when you see four four one, you're like, oh, this guy is a burner. I don't think Ricky Pearsall is a burner. I think it's the short area stuff that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting in that four four one because that's what it looks like on tape to me. Most of the athleticism comes in that burst, that that short area burst, that getting in and out of your breaks. And clearly he puts time in too, Croc. And that's the thing I like about Ricky Pearsall the most. And it's the thing that makes George Kittle great. It's the thing that makes Brock Purdy great. It's the thing that makes Christian McCaffrey great. It's the thing that makes uh, Nick Bosa great. It's the thing that makes Trent Williams. And, um, you know, name all the great 49ers recently. They work their butts off at being as good as they possibly can. Their ball is life. And, and that's what Ricky Pearsall is. 17 bench press reps. He's putting in time. And he's a pretty narrow-hipped guy, thin-legged guy, which I think he doesn't play with the most um, the most play strength. But he's putting in work in the weight room, and he's got himself some, you know, he's building up his upper body at least. Like, he's, he's building up strength that maybe he at one point did not have when he was a skinny three-star re- recruit in Chandler, Arizona, the same town that Brock Purdy was in, playing each other in high school before he went to Arizona State and kind of made himself into the player he is, getting better and bigger and stronger and faster all the way through his college career until he got to his redshirt senior season at Florida when he led the team in receiving with 65 catches and 965 yards, four touchdowns, 
Uh, he also had a 14 yard rushing touchdown as well. Debo Samuelish looking usage on a, on a couple plays, Croc. I don't know if he's going to be a complete yak bro in the NFL, but one thing I know watching Ricky Pearsall, Croc, is he is going to be dynamite in the slot. He is going to get open. He is going to make catches on third downs, and he is going to win in the intermediate area of the field and uh and and break off routes there and that's where Kyle Shanahan wants to operate that's where Brock Purdy does his best work and I think the fit there out of the slot especially moving him around keeping him giving giving him a free release and letting him get into his route and use those quicks and use his ball skills which he has phenomenal ball skills as well and tracking ability and ability to go get the ball those are the things that I'm really sure about I, I think He's got a very high floor because of those things, even if he doesn't develop into a dynamite yak player or even if he doesn't develop into a, a dynamite like outside receiver, deep ball guy. There is a lot of utility what he already can do and what I'm convinced he'll be able to do in the NFL. Now You talked about the Debo Samuel usage, and that was something that was very interesting to see on, on film. You know, I, I watched him, you know, uh, Ricky Pierce, my, my best friend, my brother Donald. He is a Florida Gator fan. And we watch a lot of Florida Gator games and we're watching this guy and, you know, he's productive and he's catching passes, but you don't watch him. And I, and through the eyes of an evaluator. So now, okay, the 49ers drafted him. Let's sit here. Let's watch. him. And he's lined up on, out, on the outside and he runs around and they get the ball to him and he's running double moves. And then he's in the slot. Then they're motioning him multiple times per game. Sometimes they hand it to him. Sometimes they don't. They did that little orbit motion that the 49ers do with Debo Samuel, give it to him. We saw him burst off a long touchdown run doing that. They'll line him up in a, in a, a bunch to the right. He'll be the point man where maybe he has to block, has to block on screens. So he's throwing his body around, not strong as a guy, not the big, most play strength, but he's a, a willing blocker, which Kyle Shanahan maybe was like, hey, you're not Ronnie Bell, you're blocking, but I, I can live with this. All right. Then you see him on the outside in a bunch. And they're throwing screens to him. They're figuring out different ways to get the ball in his hands. So from that standpoint, you definitely see a lot of that Debo Samuel usage. Now, he is not Debo Samuel. I, I don't think on any play, uh, and again, you can go back South Carolina film with Debo Samuel, and the yards after catch, it jumps off like right away. Boom. Oh, man. Oh, my man. Look how this guy did that. You don't say that with Ricky Pearsall, but you do say, man, look how he got up in here. Look how they used him here. Look, look at him at the top of this route. Look how he shook loose here. Man, look how he separates. Man, when they're playing off, they have no chance when they're playing off and that space is created. He's turning guys around. He's getting on their toes quick. He understands leverage. He catches everything. Had a 3% drop rate. Like, he doesn't drop the ball. You know, those were a lot of things that I felt like, man, I could see how his game translates to what the 49ers want. And whether he's in the slot where – that might be his best uh, – the place he goes to and gets that immediate uh, action. You know, if you told me right now he's in the slot and is not Juwan Jennings, I'd be celebrating that. And not that Juwan Jennings was bad. I just have always wanted a more dynamic, more uh, explosive player there. And Juwan Jennings, fine. He blocks. He'll catch a pass from third down here and there. But, man, give me that guy that's going to catch, you know, that can catch six or seven passes. And when you are focusing on Debo Samuel and you're putting your best cornerback on Brandon Ayuk, a guy who can win his one-on-one -on -one matchups all over the field, I would like that. And I think Ricky Pearsall, he has shown the ability to be that guy. Now, was he overdrafted? Did they did they draft him too high? Uh, I think we've seen – uh, conflicting reports on where people have them. Some people had them as a top 40 prospect. Some people with top 45, some people top 50. So, you know, where the 49ers have, that might be different than the consistent consensus, but it didn't feel like we're watching this game and what we know now from what they're looking for, or they don't like with whether it's Debo Samuel, they're drafting or it's Dante Pettis it felt like they drafted a guy that they identified. This can be his role. In our offense, he could do this, he could do that. And heck, man, we watched Adam Thielen, he plays and looks a lot like him. Maybe he could do that for us. He might end up in the end, Croc, being a little volume dependent for what you're hoping he will be. Like, because I've seen a lot of lofty expectations for Ricky Pearsall, as fans will do when you draft a first round wide receiver. You dare to dream of how great a player could be. 
Um, I, 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 he's not, the, you know, Kyle Shanahan's not Sean McVay. He's not going to go Puka Nakua as a rookie. And to be honest with you, you mentioned Juwan Jennings. I don't know how much he's going to see the field with Jennings and Debo and Ayuk as a rookie unless somebody gets hurt because uh, it, it's tough to get those veterans off the field. And we'll see if he really eats into that slot usage for for Juwan Jennings and becomes the the main third down guy, right? Because I could see that being part of it. But even when he is a starter, he's not going to get you just nobody gets 150 targets in in Kyle Shanahan's offense at wide receiver. It's just it's not a thing that happens unless maybe they're starting to uh, they're thinking about spreading the ball out a little bit more and and uh, and adding to the drop back passing game, which would be interesting. Um, one note on like sort of where he was and where he was drafted. And look, I, I did like some players that were on the board clearly more than, than Ricky Pierce all there. The thing that I always come back to is it felt like with all those six quarterbacks going early and all the teams were like, man, I can't believe that blank is still on the board for us to draft here. I can't believe Quin Quinion Mitchell's still here. We were going to trade up for him, but now we just get to sit back and take him at 22. I can't believe that, uh, that, uh, whoever, I can't believe that Chop Robinson is still here. I can't believe that Darius Robinson is still on the board for us and the Arizona Cardinals at pick number 27. I don't think John Lynch turned to Kyle at 31 and was like, oh my God, I can't believe Ricky Pearsall is still on the board right now. You know, I don't think it was that. And most of the teams in the first round kind of had that vibe because I think a couple guys slipped down because of what happened earlier on in the draft. So, so that was, I think, the reason for the disappointment for a lot of 49ers fans. They're like, okay, you might have drafted a good player, but man, um, it didn't feel like, man, wow, we got this guy. I can't believe he was there. Was there a guy at pick 31 that you felt like, okay, you would have had that reaction at 31? I mean, I kind of did have that reaction to Cooper DeGene and uh, Johnny Newton was my guy. So Johnny Newton's for sure the player okay. I would have picked there. And he went a few picks later to the Washington Commanders uh, at the top of round two. Um, just because like, and, and here's the thing about the first round. It's the place that you get offensive tackles. Ah, that guy wasn't there. It's the place that you get edge rusher, pass rushers. Ah, that, that guy just kind of went off the board. They wasn't there. It's the place where you get dynamic pass rushing defensive tackles. And that guy was there. And that's, you know, so it, the Niners ended up with, you know, two receivers that might do their best work out of the slot. They ended up with two offensive linemen that were interior offensive linemen, not tackles. They ended up, you know, so those premier positions if you're not going to get them in the first round, where are you going to get them? And they haven't had a first round pick in three years. And when they did have a first round pick, they still didn't get one of those guys. So that's where you look at team building strategy. It's like, okay, at some point you got to get some tackles for the future and you got to keep adding to your defensive line. Uh, and you've got to um, get positions that you can't get other places unless you spend $30 million in free agency for them. I just always thought it was going to be hard to get that premier player when you're picking that 31. And I know you like Newton. Like, I just – I personally wasn't – I like Darius Robinson a lot. But even Darius Robinson, it when he was sitting there, where well, he got drafted at, like, pick 27 or whenever he got drafted. But I never said, like, man, Darius Robinson. It was like, yeah, I expect him to be kind of in this range. Darius <laughs> Robinson was the guy where you're like, you're not going to trade up for him. But if he falls to you, you're like, oh, cool. I like this guy I'm going to draft him. But yeah. you're not like, oh, man, I'm going to give up a third-round pick to go up five spots to take him ahead of somebody else. And I feel like Johnny Newton was like that. I felt like, uh, you know, Powers Jackson was like that. I felt like everybody that when we were looking at the guys that were available at 31, it all felt like that, except for if they felt like, oh, we we like Cooper DeGene as safety. Then I'm like, oh, man, like, we that like is my that. number one. That's my like guy. Safety, nickel, matchup weapon in the modern NFL, move him around. They have this great plan for him. Then, yeah. And, and I would have. That that's when I would be like, I can't believe this safety is here. But when I'm looking at him at like a corner, and I don't know how the NFL is looking at him, but if they're saying, Oh, he's kind of a corner, but maybe he can play safety, but we don't even know if he can play safety, then that's when it starts to get a little weird. And I think in that spot, for a lot of the players that were available, like Xavier Leg Xavier Leggett, like I, I know a lot of people liked him. Like, I wasn't high on him at all. Uh Xavier Worthy, you know. A lot of people were high on him. We were high on the speed factor, but with the drop rate, is he going to block? Like all those yeah. things. Like, ah, and he's more than just speed. I, I like Worthy, and I have a feeling Kyle did too. And and I wonder if if the Chiefs did go get their guy there in the first round. Uh, next, we got to talk Jacob Cowing, Arizona 
wide receiver out of the fourth round. What's his role for the 49ers? If there's all these guys in the slot, where's Jacob Cowling going to play for the 49ers next? This episode of Lockdown 49ers is sponsored by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. It's playoff time in the NBA and the NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, bucks, win or lose, extra to play with on FanDuel. And you can bet on everything with that extra $150. Bucks. Slap shots, the home runs, to slam dunks, and of course, those NFL futures as well. All on an app that's safe, secure, and easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Jacob Cowing, Eric Crocker's favorite pick by the San Francisco 49ers in this draft. Uh, he is a small wide receiver out of Arizona, but he is a fast wide receiver out of Arizona. Five foot eight. Uh, 168 pounds is Jacob Cowling, but man, uh, the dude can move. The dude can make plays, played a little more outside probably in college than he'll play uh, in the NFL. If I had to guess, give you some ability to play uh, special teams as well. And I said this yesterday, Croc, about Jacob Cowling, five, eight and three eights, by the way, 168 pounds, ran a four, three, eight, 40 yard dash, one, five, two, 10 yard split, 36 inch vertical, uh, 10, one broad jump. 432 in the short shuttle, 702 three cone, and even threw up at his size 13 bench press reps, which ain't bad at his pro day. Um, and again, another older prospect, fifth year senior in Jacob County, a 23 year old prospect. He'll be 24 during his rookie season. Uh, I said that if they didn't draft Ricky Pearsall, then he's the perfect one for one replacement for Ray Ray McLeod. You know, slot guy, number four receiver, gets a handful of catches, uh, can give you a little bit short, can give you a little bit deep, and can return some kicks for you, right? But now I don't know what his role is going to be. Things getting a little crowded at wide receiver right now, Croc. You can start to peer into the future and see how things might shake out. But if there's not an injury to, say, Debo Samuel or Brandon Ayuk or Juwan Jennings, Jake McCowing might uh, see a little time on special teams, and that's about it. And I think the 49ers would be fine with that right I, I think some of these picks maybe all of them like there were some people like who's the immediate starter that they got like look when you're a loaded team like this how many realistically how many spots were open their entire offense came back like their entire starting offense their entire starting offense is back and again maybe you could improve over certain guys McKivitz but you probably would have to trade up to be able to do that at least that's what they feel defensively how many realistic spots opened up, especially after their free agency period, going out and getting multiple interior defense alignment, going out and getting an edge rusher like Leonard Floyd. You got your linebackers coming out back. Maybe there's an opportunity for a, a young rookie with Drake Greenlaw out, but they went and got Campbell. It's like, man, you had safety and maybe outside corner, depending on what they do with uh, Diamond Lenore. But there weren't just a whole bunch of spots. So how else do you make your team better? Maybe by filling in on certain spots where you did lose a guy. And that's definitely special teams. You lost your number one special team returner in the, in the kickoff game. You lost your number one returner in the punt game. And then you lost a guy that can do some of those gadgety things and touch the ball once or twice. And I think bringing in, uh, 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 uh I want to call him Calvin Austin, but uh, Jacob Cowling <laughs> all right, and Calvin Austin, same thing. If you go watch Pittsburgh, my they, guy. They, they're using him that way. Return guy. Every once in a while, you'll get a little catch here and there. He replaced, he replaced Ray Ray McLeod. He replaced, he replaced Ray Ray McLeod. So, you know, give, give, give me that guy that, hey, this is your role right now. You might have more of a defined role than Ricky Pierce saw his rookie year. But I do know one thing. Next year, there's going to be a shakeup. There's probably not going to be a Juwan Jennings. There's probably not going to be a Debo or... I, right. There's going to be some things moving around. You will be asked to have a much bigger role. So being able to get a guy acclimated to what you want to do uh, right now and have a role in the return game with his dynamic ability, get the ball in his hands. He is a play maker. And the guy that I thought was actually bigger, I would watch him. I used to, I, I would go to Arizona games to watch my guy, Jonah Coleman play. And I'm like, man, number two, and making the catch here, making the catch there, making the guy miss, getting around the corner, scoring a touchdown, catching passes, Doing a good job, uh, drop here and there. But overall, 
a very talented guy get the ball in his hands. And I think if Fortnite is planning to do that on kickoff and punt return right away. Kickoff will be interesting. Isaac Grendo could maybe even get a get a look at kickoff. Are they going to look more running back style player than wide receiver style player for the kickoff returns versus the punt returns? But Cowan can absolutely do either one and uh, should have a role for the 49ers. The big losers, the big winner in the NFL draft for the 49ers was, uh, I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident saying that maybe the biggest. The, the happiest man on the planet is Colton McKivitz right now, right? The the biggest winner in the entire draft because they didn't they didn't snip a tackle. And he's like, but he doesn't have competition. He's rolling in. He's like, I'm good. There's not even a guy that could take my job if I have a bad training camp, right? Uh, but on the flip side of that is Danny Gray and even Ronnie Bell. Things are getting you got uh they got Conley as well. The 49ers have like they they pick Trent Taylor, probably not gonna make the roster, right? I think the Cowing thing. Without Cowing, he had a chance because he's been the primary returner since yeah. leaving the 49ers, Cincinnati, Chicago, like all these teams. He's been the primary return guy. Once you brought in Cowing, I think that – and he's drafted where he was drafted, which he was drafted, what, fourth round? Let's pick the fourth round. He's probably – and he's a return guy because Danny Gray was drafted late third, but he wasn't a returner. Cowing is a returner. I think that makes it really tough for Trent Taylor's odds of making the roster. Yeah, there, there's about a dozen receivers already on the roster for the 49ers, and it would be a shock if they cut a late fourth-round pick. And so you look at the guys that he'd be competing with, special teams, and so Ronnie Bell's going to have to show something in year two. Uh, really promising to start his rookie season, then all of a sudden kind of dog, doghouse, a little detour through doghouse maybe. Did you hear, by the way, Kyle Shanahan's quote on Cam Latu? Uh, one of the reporters, I'm not sure who it was, asked him if uh, Cam Latu was going to start the start the season or start OTAs as tight end too. And Kyle just had one of those classic comments, just like kind of like, uh, "Well, guys got to get on the practice field before he can do anything." So no. Uh, and so I was like, "Oh, guy, there you go, doghouse. There might be a room for for more in the doghouse." Danny Gray's already there, I think. Um, biggest winner, Colton McKivitz. Biggest loser, Danny Gray, in this uh, 2024 NFL draft for the 49ers. Yeah. yeah. And how do you feel? Let's just say, and we have a lot more to talk about with this class, but I, I do think that getting the vibes out there and there's a lot of mixed emotions, but there are a lot of people that feel like the 49ers didn't do enough to get better. And I think that they did just enough to get better. Like, I think they did like some of the, I, Hey man, like, man, what would put the 49ers over the top? Gosh, can they get a little bit more dynamic offensively? Like that's been my thing. Right, yeah. And, and that's the thing is like I like it better that they didn't trade Debo or IU. You add P yeah. Pierce Hall to them, that's what makes you better, right? And even if they would have traded Debo or IU and gotten an offensive tackle, okay, you get better at offensive tackle maybe, but still a rookie offensive tackle, this probably in the short term makes you better than even that plan, right? Long term. At least right now. Like right, right now. Somewhat worried about tackle because, of, I mean, you, I mean, one, one of your guys is – barely starting caliber and the other guys awesome hall of famer but might not be around for very long well i do not view and i think because you know i do spend a lot of time saying man you know you gotta get better here and there and all this time i do not view mckivitz as a long-term starter and i think he might be starting a year too long like i yeah. agree yeah. with the consensus you do want to improve over him but i think where my mind has been is it's hard to do that when you're picking at 31. Like that, that's just if the 49ers are picking at 16, then oh, 100 percent that would that would be a no-brainer. And I think it would be a no-brainer for Kyle and John. Like, oh yeah, let's go with Fuaga or let's go with like that. That's a no-brainer. But when you're picking at 31, that it makes it a little tougher to try to get better at a right tackle that started for an entire season. You didn't even like bench them and bring them back. You see them do that with some, you see that around the league. Yeah, He's just your starting tackle all year long. And to think that the ninth best rookie tackle is going to come in and just automatically be better. I think, I, I don't think that's very realistic expectations. I, at don't, that spot. I, I also don't know that they got a lot better on the defensive line, losing Eric Armstead. D did they replace him? 
at all, really, w- with enough that's going to be better. They already needed to be better anyway on the defensive line. Um, Would have feel more comfortable with the guy Darius Robinson, which was drafted yeah. ahead of the Niners, but that was my guy. And yeah. in the sense of you, you just mentioned Armstead, and when I think of Darius Robinson, is like that's his, his thing. Yeah, the the new Armstead, right? Uh, a cor- like they they draft. See, th- this is where. We don't have time for this. We'll maybe talk. Let's talk about this more tomorrow because we're going to do DBs tomorrow anyway. We'll do uh, Bernardo Green and Malik Mustafa, the corner and safety drafted by the San Francisco 49ers. Let's talk about more about the second round strategy there, where the 49ers are building this thing. Uh, we've got a lot more to go to break down all of these rookies and the strategies and the team buildings in the now and the future with the San Francisco 49ers roster. And we'll be back and do it all tomorrow right here. Locked on 49ers.